Uh, how many of you listen to podcasts? All right, we got like six or seven of you, eight, ten people. All right, the rest of you need to figure out what a podcast is. Uh, <laughs> so podcasts is basically just listen to people talk. They just you know talk about anything. Uh, from, you know, true, like, uh, crime stories to, to, you know, pastors that will do, like, podcasts, and they'll just break down scriptures or whatever. I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it's random. This is just a random podcast. Uh, I was, I, I flipped on YouTube, and, like, it was in my suggestions. You ever just click on something that's in your suggestions? Well, I clicked on this podcast. I'm not going to mention it. Uh, I'm not going to drop names or anything. But I was listening to this podcast, and uh, this music artist was talking about, you know, uh, how he was very good at, at, at building momentum, but he was terrible at having balance in his life. And, man, the Lord just, like, smacked me right upside the head. And, and this morning I, wa- I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference between momentum and balance. Uh, momentum and balance. I, I want to talk to you about both those things because I think, like, uh, for us as Christians, we're probably pretty good at coming up with some momentum in our life. We're probably really good at, at finding those moments where we can just get running real quick, right? And I, so the definition of momentum is the, the quantity of motion of a moving body measured as the product of its mass and velocity. So I'm going to read that one more time because it's very wordy, I know. The quantity of motion of a moving body measured as a product of its mass and and velocity. That means that, that, that bigger things go faster. Think about it. So, uh, you know, if you drive a car, truck, or an SUV, and you're on the interstate doing 70 miles an hour, the average for you to stop from 70 miles an hour is about 10 to 15 seconds, depending on the size of your vehicle, all right? So, you know, from 70 miles an hour, that, that, that object moving forward to stop it, you're going to need a good 10 to 15 seconds to come to a complete stop. Now, if you drive a tractor trailer, you know, uh, that's pulling a, a truckload of Amazon products that are being delivered to all you fine people, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, they're, they're delivering your stuff. Uh, if you're driving that at 70 miles an hour, uh, the, the stopping rate, uh, it, it grows exponentially because there's a difference, there's a variance in weight. So from 70 miles an hour, a tractor trailer could take upwards of 20 to 35 seconds to come to a complete stop. So you think about it, if you're on the interstate, which we most of us drive the interstate unless you're really scared of it, uh, you've probably made the decision last minute that this is my exit and I need to slam on my brakes and get all the way over to get off, right? And everyone behind you is like, what are you doing, right? Uh, it, it, it doesn't stop really quickly, right? Because things that are moving, uh, the, the measurement of those movement, they produce this energy, right? This energy that just, just propels us forward. So uh, t- today, uh, the, 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 let me slow it down here. Today, the, the thought of momentum is uh, that your life is so busy. How many of you over the past, you know, several weeks have, have just said, you know, I just have all kinds of stuff to do. I'm so busy. I don't really have any extra time. Man, I'm just, you know, uh, there's a hundred things that I could be doing right now. Like, I don't have any time for this, right? Uh, We've all said that. Now, that's a byproduct of momentum because your life is moving at a pace that you can't keep up with. You, you, walk through life and, 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 and the, the daily things that we just deal with, kids and, and, and spouses and, and, and bills and, and going to work and, and, and going, you know, whether you go into the office or you work from home, the stress of trying to figure out what that looks like and how to make it work for you, right? So everyone knows how to create momentum. Everyone knows how to keep moving, to, to get busy, right? And, 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 and the byproduct of that is that, that we often miss out on opportunity. We we miss out on precious moments because we, we get too busy. We build all this momentum and we miss out on the balance that we need to have in our life. And, and, and the Lord was just dealing with me, speaking to me. Now, now, I'm not saying that all momentum is bad. I'm not saying that because we have to have forward motion. If you're not moving forward, then you are stale, you're dead, you're, you're not growing, right? But we have to figure out a way to move forward and be balanced in who God wants us to be. You see, uh, I, I often think in, in terms of momentum, a good example of momentum uh, is a new believer, 
When someone comes to know Christ, their heart is changed. And man, they, they dive in head first. They want to know as much about God as possible. So they get in the word and, and, and they read and they study and they, and they, and they per, pursue a relationship with God because they want to know more about him, right? That's good momentum. Now, an avalanche has a lot of momentum, but it also causes a lot of destruction, right? So uh, <laughs> have you ever tried to outrun an avalanche? No, good, perfect, uh, awesome. I was hoping no one would raise their hand on that. It would be really weird. Uh, you'd have to tell me that story after church. Uh, but uh, um, uh, an avalanche can be a, a bad example. Now, <laughs> there's a funny story uh, that, that, that I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Uh, so, <laughs> so this one time here at this church, uh, we were getting ready. I was still a youth pastor. I was getting ready for a bonfire that we were about to do uh, out here on the, in the backyard. Uh, if you go out the large parking lot out there. And we would do like this fire pit thing with bricks uh, on the pavement, and we were supposed to have like a concert. So we had a stack of like cinder blocks and like regular like bricks. And I went out there to set up and do what I normally do. So I was going to build a ring and everything. And, and I, I started moving blocks. And I got a couple and put them over and I went back to get the other couple. And as soon as I lifted the third brick, like this swarm of bees come roaring up out of these bricks, right? And if you know me at all, you know that I am terrified. Absolutely just, I will, I will push you down if <laughs> It is every person for the, I, I don't care if you are a woman, a child, an elderly person, I'm going to knock you down to get out of there. Uh, and so, you know, I immediately turn around and I'm like, take off, like, like, like sprinting, taking off. But what I didn't have was very good balance. So my momentum was going really good, but my balance was really terrible. So I ended up doing like a somersault. And I planted my shoulders, scuffed it all up, and I rolled, and I tried to get back up again, and, and I couldn't get my feet underneath me, and I fell again. <laughs> and I was just, if anybody would have saw it, it would have been hilarious. I felt, like, embarrassed by it, but uh, I realized in that moment that, that, that balance and momentum need to work together in order to be successful, right? So, uh, and, and the story doesn't end there, like, I really needed to, to get these bricks, but I'm allergic to bees as well. I guess I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, so I'm not just scared of them, allergic to them, but I'm also scared of them, which is logical. Uh, that's wisdom, people. Uh, but I needed to get rid of these bees, and I needed like someone to come and make sure I wasn't like concussed and like have my shoulder broken, like the adrenaline was wearing off. So I reached in my pocket to get my cell phone to call Christian Tennant uh, because he would come and save me. And I realized that when I turned around, my phone fell out into the bees. <laughs> so talking about an insult to injury. So uh, I have one of these like Apple watches. So I tried to call him on that. And I was like, Christian, help, 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 911, help. So he comes and takes care of the bees and gets my phone and rescues me and saves the day. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate you, man. Uh, <laughs> but... You ever have those moments in your life where you get moving so fast that you can't get your feet underneath you? You get moving so fast that, 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 that before you know it, you're on your butt, you're on your face. Uh, you've tried really hard, and man, you've really, really you're trying to pursue that thing, and, and you just can't seem to make your way there. You ever, try, you, you ever been in those situations? You ever been uh, in, in, a, in a moment in your life whenever you should be further along than you are, but it seems like you're just running in place and you're not really getting anywhere? Have you ever experienced those moments in your life where, uh, you know, I'm getting older and, and you know, uh, when I was younger, I thought, man, I should be a little further along than I am now. And, and what, what's holding me back? What's keeping me planted in this moment where I can't move forward into the blessing, into the favor, into the, into the plan that God has for me? If you have your Bibles, go with me uh, to, to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going we're gonna to go there in a second. But, but I, I want to do just a, a small illustration because I, I think an illustration would be a, a, a good moment for us right now. So I'm going to ask Miss Hannah Rosser to come. She's going to be my guinea pig today. Uh, I appreciate her coming and, and helping me out. Uh, you're very awesome. Come on up here. All right. All right, you're going to be right there, okay? Can everybody see Hannah? This is Hannah. Hannah, this is everybody. Hannah, this is the world. Uh, you're in multiple countries right now, so be, be on your best behavior. So today, today, I haven't told her what we're about to do either, so she's probably freaking out. Uh, it's really simple. We're just going to have a sprint race. Oh, I don't 
Yeah, okay, so you and me are gonna sprint. We're gonna race. We're, I move my stuff. Don't hit my stuff, okay? Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna race to that box over there, okay? You know how to sprint race? All right, so you gotta get down. You gotta get down because you gotta get down. All right, and then, yep, yep, get there. Oh, you got flip-flops on. You better take them off. Can you run, can you run without your flip-flops on? All right, so we're gonna sprint race, and uh, on, on the count of three... On the count of three, we're going to take off, all right? Uh, hold on, hold on. I forgot, I forgot one important thing. Hold on, hold on. All right, all right, here. I need you to put this on. So now we're ready to race. Can you get, let's get down to sprint mode, okay? All right, you ready? We're... we're we're gonna we're gonna sprint. You ready? On the on the count of three. What why aren't you in sprint form? Because I can't get down. Your your form's terrible, girl. Come on, get, can you race like that? No. You, are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. Well here, let me take it off. Thank you, Hannah. Give Hannah, give Hannah a hand. Thank you, Hannah. All right, so Hebrews chapter twelve. I mean, I'm glad that thing's light. <laughs> so Hebrews chapter 12 would say this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You see, you can't prepare for a race. You can't get into a race if you're, if you're weighted down. And this, this backpack... Uh, <laughs> To, to, to her, you know, this, to you guys, this just looks like a backpack, but to her, this is filled with like 45 pounds of weights, uh, which, I mean, she weighs like, a, like you know, two pounds. So uh, I, figured it, I figured she could probably beat me in a real race. So I needed to have an advantage, right? But, but this backpack, which has been to like multiple places, they're all around the world, uh, which is cool. It's full of weight. And the Bible is telling us here in Hebrews chapter 12 that if we're going to run a weight, run a, run a race, we need to strip off the weight that would hold us back. Now, these are physical weights, but the Bible is telling us that sin is the weight that keeps us from where we're supposed to be. The, the, the first and foremost uh, adversary to momentum and balance in your life is sin. I'm going to catch my breath for a second is sin. I don't know why I just got real excited and lost my breath. <laughs> Happens sometimes. But the sin that we have in our life will slow us down. It will keep us from being able to run an effective race, to live an effective life, to be an effective husband, to be an effective father, to be, a, to be an effective wife, a mother, a brother, a cousin, an uncle, be an effective employee, be an effective uh, church member. It will, it will cause us to not be effective in those areas. So it says to strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin so that so easily trips us up. And we should run the race, we should run with endurance the race God has set before us. So we're all in this race in life. We're all trying to, to make it to the place that God wants us to be. We're all trying to follow the path that he set before us. And, and sometimes it looks like a track. Sometimes it looks like we're just going around and we're making a turn and we're going on the straight stretch and we're making a turn and we're going on the straight stretch and we're making a turn and we're going on the straight stretch. And sometimes it looks like uh, a West Virginia road where we're, we're, winding, we're winding through valleys and going up mountains and we're coming around turns. And, and hey, look, I can see myself right there. You, were, you ever been in those roads in West Virginia where you can see yourself when you come around? Uh, it, our life looks different in, in multiple times of our lives. Sometimes it will look like the circular track. Sometimes it will look like a winding road. Sometimes it will look like a dead end. Sometimes it'll look like we've come to the, to the, to the impasse on the road and we can't go any further. And, and when our life looks like this, we have to figure out, we have to, we have to break down, we have to start to understand God's word and understand what he's trying to teach us to, about finding balance in our life. It's not just about moving forward, but it's about moving forward with purpose. I'm not moving forward just to move forward. I don't want to exert energy that I don't have to exert. Now, I, I, do, like, I do like to follow like runners. I'm not a really good runner, but but I like to run. Like anybody else like to run? I'm looking for some runners in here. I see a few folks. Uh, now, by no stretch of the imagination am I any good at this, okay? Uh, 
but I have the gear, right? I have the stuff, you know, but, but for runners, you know, it's not about, it's not about, you know, just covering distance. It's about not exerting all your energy to cover said distance, you know, finding that, finding that pace that works for you and working towards building that pace up to what would be normal. Now, now I don't run at the pace that's normal. I run at my pace, but you can't just flail your arms. You're, you're just exerting energy that you don't need to exert. You're twisting your body wrong. Yeah, there's a process that, that, that comes with running. There's a process with, with, that comes when, when we're, we're trying to learn something, right? Now, I could have just said, hey, I'm going to put on the, the running shorts and the tank top, and I'm going to put on the nice shoes, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go out and do it, right? And that works. But there's also injuries that come with that. There's also poor technique that causes injuries that comes with that. So I had to sit down and start watching videos on how to run properly. And you think that's like really silly. Like, like why, why would you, like you've been walking your whole life. I mean, it can't be that hard, right? Trust me, if you want to know a little bit more today, go home, pull up your YouTube and start looking up proper running techniques and, and, just, and just see, it's gonna blow your mind. Like seriously, it blew my mind. And, and you know, I was like, well, that makes sense. These people have been doing this their whole life. That makes perfect sense. So we have to go to a source to find information in order to be able to run our race properly. We have to be able to reach out and reach into a proper resource. Now, our proper resource is not the internet. It's not YouTube. It's not running videos. It is, if you want to know how to, if you want to, know how to run the best race, you have to get into God's word. You have to apply what God is putting in you through his word to your life so that you can learn how to have balance, how to properly run this race that God has set before us. Now, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's verse 2, Hebrews 12, verse 2, verse two says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, awaiting him he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. And verse 3 says, think of all the hostility endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Think about all the hostility that he endured. Think about all the trouble and the, tr and, and the tribulation, the trials that he faced in his life. You know, you may be finding it hard to get your feet under you in this moment. But think about Jesus. Think about his life. Think about when he walked on planet Earth and the balance that he had to hold, being God, but also being a man. Being, being God, but also being flesh and blood like you and I. He hungered. He thirsted. He he got sad by times. He had emotions like we have emotions. He was upset with his disciples by times. He had uh, an overwhelming sense of just love for people. He was hated. He was spit on. He was arrested. He was beaten. His beard was pulled out. He was nailed to a cross. These are things that Jesus experienced, right? These, but the ultimate goal of Jesus was that he endured the cross and, and he disregarded the shame of it so that he could be an advocate for us to teach us how to have balance in our lives. You see, it was never about just Jesus. It was always about doing the will of who? The Father. It was always about being about his Father's business. Now, now the world will tell you that balance looks like you got to take care of you first. Right? That's worldly balance. But I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about godly balance. Godly balance says that I put God before everything. I find my identity, my purpose, my meaning. I find my life and my joy and my peace and my patience and my understanding. I find everything that makes Sheldon who Sheldon is in God's word and having a relationship with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his Father God. That's where I find my identity. That's where we should be finding our identity. And if I want to have balance in my life, it's going to look like me putting God first. Not me saying, well, you know, God, I would love to do that, but man, I really want to do this. I really want to go over here and do this thing. And God says, well, then you can have an unbalanced life because he gives me that choice. He gives you that choice. We all have a choice to make when it comes to the balance that God wants to supply in our lives. But if we're, if we're unbalanced, then that means that we're going to be chasing everything but God. We're going to be living for everything but God. We're going to be living for public opinions. Uh, we're going to be living for 
uh, our neighbors, and, and, and you know, those are the things that are byproducts of our relationship with God. If you have a good relationship with God, then you should have a good relationship with your spouse. If you have a good relationship with God, you should have a good relationship with your kids. If you have a good relationship with God, then you should have a good relationship with your coworkers. If you have a good relationship with God, then you should be able to have a good relationship with anybody. Listen, I'm telling you, this is a nugget of truth that I want you to catch today. If you can have a good relationship with God, if you can trust him and lean on into your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, he will direct your path. This is the God that we, that we were talking about today, the God that loves you so much that he was willing to disregard the shame of the cross and endure the pain and the suffering and endure uh, being mocked and persecuted so that you could have life and you could have a relationship with him. The God of the universe saw fit to send his son Jesus to do that for us. Man, if we, if we believe that a relationship with him, that, 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 that putting that relationship and having that priority on that relationship would, would instill in us the balance that we need to live a life that's pleasing to him and pleasing to, and pleasing to uh, our, our families and our friends, then we would jump right on that, wouldn't we? But balance often gets confused with momentum all the time because we think if we're moving, then we're, we're purposeful. But I know a lot of people that, that spin their wheels and they move and they move and they move and they never get anything accomplished. It seems like they're always in crisis. They're always in struggle. And, and the, the, the God that they do have in them uh, is always, and the Holy Spirit that they do have in them is always trying to fix them. So they can't be effective in their relationship with others because they're always the one that's needing to be fixed, needing to be fixed. And, and you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a loner by nature. I'm, I'm a little bit of like, you know, I could, go to a, I could go to an island right now and survive by myself for the rest of my life. I could do that. Absolutely. But I'm not, I'm, I could do that. I could do that. I absolutely could. I would find ways to, to entertain myself. I'm pretty funny, so, you know, I think I am. So I would just tell myself jokes and stuff, and I would be good to go. But I realize that not all people are like that. I realize that, that there's a, a uniqueness to all of us. Now, for me, I don't need a whole lot of people telling me I'm awesome to think that I'm awesome, because I could do that all by myself. <laughs> truth. I'm giving you some truth today. <laughs> I'll give you some truth today. But I know that there are people that need to have, you know, uh, how, do I, how do I politely put this, to, that need encouragement. There you go. Encouragement. They need encouragement, right? They need to be encouraged. They need to have people uh, coming alongside them and saying, you know, hey, you, you know what? You're doing really good. You're doing awesome. And I love to be an encourager to people, but I feel like God is the ultimate author of encouragement. If we get into his word and we understand who he is to us, then he will encourage us through his Holy Spirit. He will encourage us through, through the words that are written on the page. He will give us exactly what we need in this moment. But we waste, we squander, we don't have a balance in our life. So, so the Holy Spirit has to spend all of the time fixing me. And therefore, the Holy Spirit can't spend time fixing others because that's what the Holy Spirit should be doing in you. It should be reaching out to the lost and reaching out to the hurting and, and those that are in need. And, and we have this imbalance in our life where, where, where it's all about me. It's all about us. It's all, you know, hey, I could do that. Or, hear me out, Lord, I could just focus on me. And the Lord says, well, wait a second, I already focused on you. Now it's time for you to focus on somebody else. Take what you've been given and give it away. Take what you've been given and plant it in somebody else. Take what you've been given and give it to somebody. That's balance. That's, that's a restorative balance. Now think about the cross for a second. The cross is a beautiful example of, of restoring balance. You see, through Christ's suffering and, and his ultimate death on the cross, he restored balance for us. It was a restoration moment because where we were once disconnected from God through his son Jesus and through the act of the cross, we are now connected to God. We have access. The, the Bible says that when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross, that the, the veil in the temple was torn, that the Holy of Holies became available to us and we could go in now and have access to, to the Holy Spirit that we didn't have to take uh, blood offerings and sacrifices to priests to go in and, and on our behalf, uh, you know, go into the Holy of Holies. Now we can walk in there freely. We can walk in and have access. We can be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit now. Talk about a balance restoring moment. Man, God is so good to us. And we, we need to start thinking that way that, man, God is so good to you. 
You may have struggle in your life right now. You may be dealing with things that, that, that in the natural are, are above your head and you feel like you're underwater, but you need to start learning to remind yourself that God has already restored balance in your life that it's there for your taking, that you can reach out and grab a hold of the balance that God has for you, that you can do great things if you just trust God and, and use his opportunities and use the word that he's given you and, and, and all the good things that God just, just I have another ob object lesson here. So this is a BOSU ball and it's not supposed to bounce like that, but it does. Can you all, can you all see that over there? Who wants to volunteer to stand on that? No, I'm playing. I'm not going to make anybody come here. Disclaimer, I don't want them getting hurt. <laughs> uh, so this, this ball here is, is, is for exercise. And if you flip it over, you can do a whole bunch of stuff on it. And on this side, it actually reads, uh, standing on this uh, side increases your risk of falling. Uh, seaside, seaside label for, for details. And uh, I won't read, I'll spare you the side label because uh, it's like do it at your own risk. Uh, but this is our life right here. And this is what our life does. And, and as we look at this and as we see it bouncing around there, we understand that, that life is unsteady sometimes. It's uncertain. Like there are areas where, where it just shifts and, and, and if you're not ready, it's gonna knock you down. Uh, there, there are relationships that are gonna abruptly end and you're gonna be like, what did I do? What happened? Like, like the, 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 it's, it's the rug's just going to be pulled right out from underneath you. You're going to fall flat on your face. And, and for this guy, it, it just makes it really hard because it's like, how do, you, how do you get on this thing? And, you know, once, once you get knocked down, how do, you, how do you get back up and get on this thing? It makes it difficult because it's so unsteady and uncertain. But then when we take our lives and we root it in Christ, when we plan ourselves in him, it gives us an opportunity where we can stay in the center with him. And our lives become more secure because of who he is. And then before you know it, Stephen, I was going to I was going to have you bring that slack line. I was totally thinking about it, man. I thought about you all week, brother. Uh but once you figure out that your life is rooted in Christ, then you can stand knowing that even though the foundation that your life is, is, is rooted on is uncertain, that you have a, a, an anchor that will give you weight, that will hold you down so that when the storms of life come and you find yourself in those situations, that you won't have to lean on your own understanding, but you can acknowledge God and he's going he's gonna to give you the momentum to just keep on keeping on, to go. And no matter what the world throws at you, no no matter, no matter what, what wind comes and waves and, oh, 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 I almost lost it there, but God, I almost fell off the thing, but God, man, oh, my legs are starting to shake, but God, and you can find the balance that God has placed within you and you can use that balance to, to, to stand firmly, that no wind can shake you, that no circumstance can break you, that when life comes at you, you're gonna meet life exactly the way that God intended you to on both feet, standing on the firm foundation of Jesus, knowing that the balance that you have is not in you, but it's in Christ, knowing that, that, that with him, all things are possible, that you can conquer demons, that you can stand, you can tread on on serpents, that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You know that, that when you stand on his firm foundation, that even whenever the winds blow and the waters rise, and if I had some shorts on, I'd be doing some crazy stuff right now. These pants don't make it real easy to get down. They look good though. <laughs> but whenever even you find yourself in those moments of life where, where you're struggling, where you feel like you might fall off the thing. Man, I just feel like, Lord, my legs are getting tired. I'm, I'm struggling, I'm fighting, and it's just becoming so hard. It's so hard to just find balance in my life. People don't like me. My heart's heavy. That you can hear the whisper of God saying, if you'll just hold on a little longer, if you'll just hold on a little longer, I'm training you right now to find that stability that you need. You see, momentum and balance equal endurance. And the Bible says in Hebrews 12 that we run the race with endurance. But you can't get endurance if you're, you're A, not moving, 
and B, not finding that balance. They're hand in hand. They go hand in hand. You want to be moving forward. You want to be balanced in God. You need to find that strength to go another minute. You need to find that dig, that drive to say, yes, I've been running for a while now and I'm out of breath and man, my stomach hurts because, it, because I've been running so hard, but I'm almost, I've almost beat my time from yesterday. I've almost, I've almost went twice as far as I did yesterday. And if I'll just keep running a little bit more, if I'll just fight through the pain, if I'll just fight through the insecurity, the uncertainty, if I just keep moving, if I just keep moving, man, I'm going to have a personal best. If I keep moving, I'm going to get to where I'm supposed to be going. I'm going to re- I'm going to meet the goal that's set before me. I'm going to run the race with endurance. And when I stand before God, he's going to say, good, good. you did it. Awesome. He's going to give me an attaboy and add a girl, right? You just have to keep moving. You have to keep moving. I haven't stood on this thing in a long time. The uncertain parts of our lives, the dismount, that's always the hardest. So, the idea is that the race is not going to stop. It's not going to stop. The race just continues to go on whether you decide to run it or not. The race will always keep moving forward. We have to be uh, focused. We have to be balanced. And balance means an, an even distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. Man, I wish we could just change the, the word balance to God because it would just make so much more sense. The, the, the even distribution of weight. You see, whenever, whenever my burdens seem to be too heavy, they're not too heavy for God. He, he not only was crucified on a cross, he carried that instrument of death. While he was beaten and bruised and bloodied and, and ribs were showing, and watch the passion, you'll see a, a glimpse, a glimpse of what it was actually like. It was, it was worse, way worse. Uh, but, but he carried the, his own instrument of death. And as he was nailed to it, the stability, the, the balance that was restored in our lives, that, 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 we were, uh, that we were upright and steady because we know that his act sealed the promise for us. Seal the promise for us. Momentum and, and balance are endurance. Uh, you have to learn to manage yourself. You know, how many managers are in the room? Okay, I see a few of you. All right, a good manager has to work hard to delegate and to make sure that the employees that are underneath them are, are fulfilling the job that is required of them, right? And that manager has another manager, like a district manager or, a, 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 you know, the, the, the CEO of the company who delegates to them and it all just transfers down, right? Well, good managers will lead by example. Good managers, I'm going to snack a drink of this, okay? All uh, right. Good managers will lead by example. Good managers will, will always take the initiative to, 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 to train the people that are underneath them. Good managers will always take an opportunity to build relationship with those that are underneath them. Why? Why is it important to build relationship with people that you manage? Because it's easier for you to go to them when things go wrong. It's easier for you to sit down with them and say, hey, here's the mark. Here's how we missed it. Let's work towards fixing it. It's easier to do that. But think about it this way. We are all managers of our life. We've been given the, the responsibility to manage ourselves. It's called free will. You have it. I have it. We all have it. We've all been given the opportunity to manage our life. And God is our manager. He's the one that's saying, hey, I've given you the employee manual which is called the Bible. All I need you to do is read it, sign with your life. I've already done that. Hopefully you've done that as well. And follow it. But a lot of times we miss out because we haven't asked ourselves the most important question. And pastor, you preach this, like this has been like a, like a month and a half of just good words, man. Just, just blowing it out, like changing people's minds and hearts and lives. And it's just been awesome. But you, you preached a message a couple weeks ago, uh, and it was, uh, what are you thinking? And the question that I want to ask you this morning is, what's going on inside your mind? 
Like, what's happening in there? What's rattling around in there? What kind of information's in there? You see, Romans 12, 2 says that we shouldn't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new, new person by doing what? Changing the way that you think. You see, good management will help you to change the way that you think. Good management will help you understand that it's not just about doing what you like. Now, how many of you work in a job where you do things that you don't like? I figured everybody's hand would go up. Y'all unemployed? Everybody work for themselves? If you do, I'm sure you hate your boss. <laughs> I'm, play, I'm playing. <laughs> but we all have moments, we all have moments in our lives where, where we, have to, we have to find uh, the way to, to understand how we think. We have to stop, stop being rooted in, in, in a worldly way that we think. Because, you know, Romans 12, 2 is very, very important because it says don't copy the behavior. That means that you witness it, you see it. I see the behavior of the world. I see the way people act. I see, I see people fighting and, 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 and you know, clawing and, and climbing over each other. I see that. You see that, don't you? But we're not to copy that behavior. We're, we're, we're not to become like them, but we're supposed to let God transform us, transform me, transform you the way that we think. Because ultimately, you are in a management position of yourself. And God has given you the instruction. He's told you that, hey, I'm going to teach you a new thing. I'm going to give you something new, something that will, will change your life forever. Uh, and it says that when we learn God's will, right, that it's pleasing and it's perfect. How cool is that, that his will for us is pleasing and perfect? Therefore, if we're not copying the behavior of the world. So changing the way that we think is like managing yourself. It's letting God transform the way that you think. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to just grab these five keys that I'm about to throw up here, and they're going to throw them up on the screen for you. But five keys to change the way that you think, because I think a lot of what, us having an instability in our momentum and our balance is because we just, we don't really know how to think. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. We don't know how to effectively place the word of God into us. And uh, so I want to go through these five keys with you. Key number one that you approach each day and each task wholly confident in God's love. Each day, each task, wholly confident in God's love. And Colossians 3, 2 would say that we should think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. How many of you uh, in here hate Mondays? Okay, all right, it's a mixed bag. I, I figured there would be some people, oh, Mondays. You know why you hate Monday? Because you haven't allowed the Lord to teach you that Mondays are precious. Yeah, I set you up. Sorry. Not sorry. Now listen, listen, we all, we, we all fall into that Monday syndrome. We all fall into that by times. Like, it's like, man, you know, I really just need an extra day. I get it. But we need to allow the Lord to teach us to think, to change the way that we think about those things that we uh, dread, right? Those things that, that man, I, I got anxiety about this. Everybody has anxiety about something. We all have to learn how to work through it. I'm not going to say get over it. We have to learn how to work through it because we'll all have anxiety. I had some anxiety this morning. I got a text message first thing that we, you know, we had some team stuff change. And man, instantly I was like, <laughs> and I wanted to melt into a puddle. But you know what? I have to be reminded, too, that I'm supposed to think of, th uh, of the things of heaven. Uh, set my mind on things above, not things below, right? That I have to change the way that I... Today is always a good day to have a good day. And it sounds corny and cheesy, and I apologize for the delivery of it, but it's the truth. You have to set your mind on God and know that today is a blessing that only he could have gave you. That it, this is an opportunity that you have right now to live in his blessing and his promise, to breathe breath and to just live life and, and spend time with your, with your spouse and your kids and your family. And, and you know, uh, little Johnny's going to lose his tooth and you get to like, you know, pull it out with the Nerf gun and, and little Susie's going to like get on the side 
softball team, and man, you get to go to the game and, and be, just be joyful knowing, hey, those are my kids, man, and they're just doing, they're God's creation, and they're just doing so good. You get to go to that job that earns you a paycheck so that you can go on vacation and that you can, you can pay your bills and you can have air conditioning when it's 90 degrees outside. You get the opportunity to do that, so you need to start allowing God, say, God, I need you to show me the way. Remember, we're talking about not copying the behaviors of the world. Now, the world's very good at saying Mondays are terrible. Oh, the Mondays. Mondays here are actually pretty good because they're Tuesdays. Because uh, the church office does Tuesday through Friday. You guys get that. <laughs> okay. All right. But even, even our Tuesday or our Monday is a good Monday because we get to come and be together. We, we normally talk about the services and, and you know, uh, we, we get to, you know, talk about you guys. Uh, all in a good way, all in a good way, uh, because we see people coming back, and it's like, oh, so good to see you guys, and, and, you know, just encouraging, so encouraging. Number two, that you approach each task, no matter how small, as a task done for, the go- for God in his glory. Now, Colossians 3.23 would say, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Now, this is whether you uh, are going to your job, whether you're mowing the grass, whether you're washing the dishes, doing some laundry, whether you're cleaning a toilet, whether, whether you're picking a piece of trash up off the floor, you have to allow God to change your mind in knowing that that's not just something that you're doing, but it's, it's for the glory of God. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. If you change your mindset and you walk into your work week and you say, yes, my boss is a jerk. Yes, my boss needs salvation. Yes, my boss needs the Lord and I'm going to pray for him. But you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to outdo myself in working for him so that he can see that there's something different about me. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, go on a rant on social media. Please stop doing that. Grow up, people. Uh, I'm not going to go on a rant. Uh, I wanted to go on a rant one time, but then I realized that I'm not a child. And mm. listen, you're doing more damage to yourself than you're doing good. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, allow the Lord to change the way that you think. The, there's no task that's too menial that you can't put glory on God with it. When you walk through the hallways of, of this house and you see a piece of trash on the floor and you take the time to stop and pick it up and carry it to a garbage can and throw it in, you've done that as unto the Lord. You will get to heaven one day and God will say, let me open up the book here and, and just read some of the blessings. And, and he's going to say, remember that time that you were in the church and you walked down the hallway and you picked up a piece of trash or you came and volunteered to, to sweep the floor or you mowed some grass or you did something that you thought was just so mean like meaningless, but God says there's value and purpose in it. There's absolute value and purpose in it. I'm almost done. Uh, number three, that you will use each moment as a gift from God. Psalms 90, 12 says that, that Lord, teach us to realize the, the, the brevity, the, the briefness of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Lord, help us to understand that the moments that we have are a precious gift from you because we don't know what the next moment holds for us, whether it's life or whether we're in the ground. You don't know if you're going to have the opportunity to, to do better tomorrow, so you might as well do better today because if you don't do better today, you may not have tomorrow. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just letting you know that, that your life is but a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. It's like the grass that withers and dies in a moment. When the sun comes out and and it withers and dies, you don't have time to regrow it. It's dead. And there's there's coming a day where we're all going to pass from this earth. But in this moment, you have to decide that I'm going to use what I have right now. I'm going to use my life and the moments that I'm given as a gift. I'm going to treat it as if as if. I don't get another one. This is my last birthday. This is my last anniversary. This is my last Monday. This is my last Tuesday. It's my last. It's my last conversation that I'm going to have with somebody. How am I going to treat them? What am I going to do? It's the last. You have to look at it and allow God to change the way that we think. Number four, that you will treat each person as a person created by God and precious to God. Ephesians 4.2 says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. We should always treat other 
people as if they are precious to God because guess what? The secret's out the bag. They are precious to God. He wants none to perish but all to come to know him. And every person that we come in contact with, whether they're in sin or not in sin, listen to me at home, whether, whether you're watching this for the first time and you don't know Christ as your personal savior, he wants to know you. He loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. If you're in this house and you don't know the Lord, he wants to love you more than you've ever been loved before. You can't get love like this from your spouse or from your girlfriend or boyfriend. You can't find it in a bottle. You can't find it in a syringe. You can't find it in a pipe. You can't find it out on the corner. Only way that you can find it is by coming into relationship with Jesus Christ and knowing that he is there for you. Use the opportunity that you have to show someone the compassion that Christ has showed you. I think back to my life, and man, the Lord has just been compassionate to me. Mackenzie, would you come and play? The Lord has just been so compassionate in my life. I shouldn't be standing here before you. I shouldn't be in this, in this position that I'm in. I shouldn't be here. But he saw something in me that I couldn't even see. He loved me when I was unlovable. He loved me when I hated me, when I didn't like the person that I saw. In the, he, he loved me then. And he still loves me, even though I look terrible by times. When I fail, he still loves me. He's gentle. He's patient. He's kind. Number five says that you will give your failures and sins no power to erode or diminish your confidence in God and your peace with God. Psalm 73, 26 says, My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. We have to remind ourselves that even in the moments when we fail, even in the moments when we're, when we're, when we're at our worst, when we are a hot mess, when we are uh, just terrible, that God's love for us is not diminished there, that, that even though I may fail, even though my health may fail, even though things may not go good in my life, even though I, I may have been raised in an abusive uh, relationship or, or maybe, maybe my spouse is, it, it treats me bad or, or, or maybe you, you grew up not knowing what love was, that God is reminding us. He wants you to plant these words in your heart today, that my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart and that he's mine forever. He's mine. Make it personal. He's yours. He's mine. He's mine forever. That, that, that nothing that I do, the, one of the biggest struggles in life is, is getting back up when you fall. One of the biggest things is, is picking yourself up dusting yourself off and finding your balance again. There's going to be moments when it's hard. Just as I was standing on that, there's going to be moments when when life is going to come at you so hard and hit you like a ton of bricks and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt so bad that you're going to wish that you didn't have to get back up. But God is challenging us and I'm challenging you this morning that it's not just good enough to be moving. We have to be moving with purpose that there has to be a balance, that we have to find the balance in our relationship with Christ. 